Okay, well, it is 11 a.m., August 28th, 2020. Welcome to the DLI webinar. My name is John Fauci, and I am the Director, Special Project at the UNC System Office. I'll be sitting in for Dr. Jim today. As you all know, Dr. Jim Pazinski is the Vice President for Digital Learning, and Jim typically leads these discussions. Jim really, really values our monthly DLI webinars as they provide great input to our planning and scheduling of events and activities and priorities. So Jim has asked me to step in today. He sends his apologies, but he said he will be watching our presentation later on. So again, my name is John Fauci, Director of Special Projects, and I have the great opportunity of providing you with some announcements that will make you aware of some of the resources and activities that are going on within the UNC Digital Learning Office. Many of these activities are related to supporting our faculty in the transition to online learning, as well as resources designing effective online courses. And so what you'll see here on the announcements are that the recent Designing Effective Online Courses uh, workshop that was developed by our faculty fellows at the system office in conjunction with Jim Pazinski, myself, and UNC TV, that registration is still open. There's been significant need from faculty around the system to participate in this workshop. So feel free to visit the dli.northcarolina.edu website to learn more and perhaps register for this course. Another announcement here is that our DIOC alumni, and we use DIOC affectionately, that is our Designing Effective Online Courses. That is our acronym. But for faculty who have graduated from our DIOC course, your course will remain open for at least one year. And you're also welcome to our ongoing faculty office hours where you can speak with the instructors who are uh, delivering our active DIOC courses. And there are other resources out there on DLI, things related to uh, moving to our alternative instructional formats. There's also a course on Online Learning 101, which is an asset for faculty to provide <laughs> students online learning, as well as a list of free or low-cost education products due to COVID. The, another strategic initiative at the system office is what we call the Course Enhancements Project. We have 10 or so courses that have been created in an open educational resource format for our high enrollment courses. Go out to dli.northcarolina.edu if you're looking for online education resources. You might find some very valuable resources out there. And again, dli.northcarolina.edu will get you to all of these resources and the ability to sign up for some of our uh, course activities. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. We have a really, really strong agenda today. There are two key topics that we'll be addressing. One is Camtasia for Instruction and Learning, and that will be delivered by Dr. Thomas Rogers uh, with the Western Cal Carolina University, and connecting with your students using interactive assessments and simulations. Now, both of these areas of instructional technology were identified by our growing digital learning community, and we're really happy to have Per Norander, who is a lecturer, Department of Economics from UNC Charlotte, Aaron Swartz, Learning Specialist from McGraw-Hill, and Jay Guthrie, who's the District Manager of McGraw-Hill, as well as, and again, uh, Tom Rogers with Western Carolina, delivering these presentations today and sharing their knowledge and expertise in these areas. So thank you very much. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Thanks John. John. I'm sorry about that. everybody. Hello. And um, the first version of Camtasia was published in 2002. TechSmith, who puts out Camtasia, updates it every 10 to 18 months. I'll let y'all work on the uh, math of how many upgrades that's been since they first uh, put it out in 2002. I recently upgraded to Camtasia 2020, recently as in last week. And there are some new things in the upgrades that I'm in the process of figuring, figuring out. One is pre-built video templates, which sounds really neat. They have some things out there so you don't have to build it all on your own. And then also they've got the ability to create and share templates, which is another interesting thing given COVID and us trying to collaborate as faculty. A last one out there is magnetic tracks, which I don't know what that is yet, but I'm going to figure it out. 
with these upgrades and improvements in mind, I'm going to play a video for you that I created in Camtasia to introduce you to and give you some context for the Camtasia software. I'm here to introduce and demonstrate some of the capabilities of Camtasia and let you know why I use, and I think you should use, Camtasia. Camtasia is an entry-level to mid-level video editing software package put out by TechSmith. While it also has some audio capability, the strength of Camtasia is in its screen capture and video editing capabilities. With a shorter learning curve than other video editing programs, Camtasia is an effective tool for faculty to create lessons for their flipped, hybrid, and fully online asynchronous courses. For example, you can capture work from your computer screen, or you can import a video from your camera or your cell phone. In Camtasia, you can publish your video to a variety of places, an MP4 file, YouTube, Vimeo, Screencast, and others. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to do the following. Describe the basic capabilities of Camtasia and explain how you might apply Camtasia for your own online material. Now, let me show you how I use Camtasia for my classes to add impact and emphasis. Currently, I teach project management classes and I need to show figures from the Project Management Book of Knowledge. For short, the PMBOK. Showing this figure in full makes it essentially illegible. So, I use Camtasia's zoom and pan capability to magnify and move through the figure to point out specific items my students need to know. In another lesson, I need to demonstrate the concept of a work breakdown structure for a project. You start with the end of the project in mind, break it down into large blocks or sub-projects, and further break these down into work packages. Completing and combining the results of these work packages is how we successfully complete the project. This approach demonstrates to students the different levels of a project they must consider and how they must fit together. Further, I use Camtasia's custom animation to have my sources scroll up the screen at the end of a presentation. I've found that this approach helps to give students a sense of completion for a lesson because it is how you see the credit scroll at the end of a movie. Sometimes, I believe it helps build a connection with my students if they can see me. So, I create videos of me to insert in a lesson. To generate this video of me without showing me on the entire screen, I stand in front of a green screen and record the video. Then, I use Camtasia's Remove a Color tool to remove the green screen. By the way, have you noticed the studio I'm standing in? I set up my camera in my front yard and recorded the clouds floating by. I created the pillars and windows in Microsoft PowerPoint and saved it as a PNG file. You can also build your own studio in Adobe Photoshop, GIMP, or some other image editing software. Now that I've shown you a smattering of what you can do within Camtasia, let me use this presentation to show you the software. The home page where you start for a project has three main elements, the timeline, the canvas, and the tools. The timeline has tracks that build on each other. Track one is the furthest from the audience. Track two is in front of track one, and track three is in front of track two. With these three tracks in mind, imagine you're in an auditorium watching a play. Track one is the backstage farthest from the audience. Track two is in front of track one. And track three is the front of the stage closest to the audience. If you put something really big in track three, the audience will not be able to see tracks one and two. 
For this lesson, I have the clouds, which are my background, and track one, which is the farthest from you, the audience. I have my studio on track two, which is in front of track one, which makes it appear that you are looking out of the windows of the studio at the clouds. Then I can add video of me. Keep in mind that the higher the number of the track, the closer it is to the audience. The canvas is where you see the results of what you put on the timeline. You can see the impact of your changes here and understand how your completed video will look for your audience. The tools are to the upper left part of the home page. This is where you find shapes and callouts that you can add to your presentation, transitions, and the remove a color option I used earlier. I cannot show you all of Camtasia's tools in this short presentation, but now you know where to find them. A word of caution is in order here. Think about what you want to present and how you want to present it before you start your work in Camtasia. You can waste a lot of time playing with the different tools that are available in Camtasia. Trust me. Now is a good time to talk about the equipment you need for Camtasia. You need a computer with an i7 or higher processor, which is pretty standard in computers these days, and either 16 gigabytes of RAM or 8 gigabytes of RAM and a 4 gigabyte graphic processing unit or GPU. You can create video and audio material for Camtasia using the camera and microphone on your computer or Quite frankly, the camera and microphone on your phone, which often gives you better results than using your computer. So, you know, I use a Blue Yeti microphone. Yes, I know my Blue Yeti is black. And my daughter's Nikon D3200 camera. The better your video and audio equipment, the better your recorded material will be. Be aware, however, that you can pretty much spend what you want on equipment. When thinking about the equipment you need, have in mind what you want to do with the material you record before you buy anything. Don't buy what you don't need. Let's compare some features of Panopto versus Camtasia versus Adobe Premiere Pro. For video editing, Panopto offers some simple editing where you can remove a segment of video or add previously recorded segments of video. Camtasia has advanced video editing capability, which, as we saw earlier, allows you to zoom in, pan across the canvas, and animate segments of video like I do with my sources. With Adobe Premiere Pro, you have the video editing capability to create a Hollywood or Bollywood feature length film. To my knowledge, Panopto does not have the ability to edit the audio separate from the cutting and splicing of the video. Camtasia has the basic audio editing tools, but if you want more extensive capabilities, you'll need to take the audio portion of your material to a program like Reaper. Adobe Premiere Pro has audio editing capabilities within the program itself. Or you can take your audio file to Adobe Audition, use the full suite of audio editing tools there, and then move the file back to Adobe Premiere. As it is a more basic program, the learning curve for Panopto is minimal. The learning curve for Camtasia is short, but there is a learning curve. The learning curve for Adobe Premiere Pro is steep. If you go retail, currently, the basic plan for Panopto is free, and Panopto Pro is $14.99 per month. Western Carolina provides Panopto to faculty, so for me, the education cost is free. Currently, Camtasia costs $249 at retail, but you can purchase it for an education price of $169. Adobe Premiere Pro is provided as software as a service, that is SaaS, 
for a monthly fee of $20.99 for the standalone version. You can subscribe to the entire Adobe Creative Cloud suite of programs, which includes Premiere Pro, for a monthly fee of $52.99. There is an educational price of $19.99 per month for the Adobe Creative Cloud suite for the first year. It's $20.99 per month after that. The cost of Camtasia is in the mid-range, which matches with this software being an entry-level to mid-level video editing program, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. To wrap up, I want to say I've been using Camtasia for several years and continue to be a fan of this software for creating lessons for my classes. I believe the video editing capability combined with the relatively short learning curve make it a useful tool for faculty to create lessons. I'll be happy to take any questions now, or if you have questions in the future, please feel free to email me or give me a call. Thanks for listening to this presentation. So, so. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's the, the presentation, presentation. That's the introduction to Camtasia. Well, that was fantastic, Tom. Thank, thank you for taking the approach of actually delivering the presentation in a video form to demonstrate, the, you know, the robust features functionality within Camtasia. I know that there are a lot of faculty and instructional design staff who are very interested in this tool. And I think that was very helpful. And oh, oh, by the way, I really love your office view. It's it's amazing. Well, well I, I, appreciate I appreciate that. that. It, took it took a long, long time, time to get, get it there and iterative process. process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what I could, it, it, maybe you can help confirm this one question from my end. I believe there is a Camtasia trial version where folks can sign up for a limited time. That is correct. Test it out. Yes, you can sign up for uh <laughs> couple of weeks, I think it is a two week trial. The nice thing about the trial version is it is a full blown version of Camtasia. It's not a pared down with some features not available. It's fully available. Fantastic. And I would assume anything you create in that trial version could be ported over if you chose to purchase, you know, an ongoing subscription. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And oh, by the way, uh, I have a blue Yeti as well. And it actually is blue. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the black one has a USB port on the bottom as well as the XLR cable on the bottom. Got it. And yeah. I, I think that's the only color it comes in to have the XLR cables, which are the old microphone cables. Gotcha. So, and I'm, so again, I'm sorry about the way things blew up at the beginning, but my original computer came back. No worries. This was fantastic. And we do have time for a couple of quick questions, if you don't mind. So Absolutely. Or let me check the chat real fast. Uh, Someone is saying that they did the, the trial first, and then when it was getting close to the trial version expiring, I got an email from Camtasia, subscription ends. Can you, well, can you still uh, get it for 139 instead of 169 at that point? I guess my, that's understanding is, can... my understanding is the education version of Camtasia right now is $169. Got it. They also went up a little bit on the retail price. The nice thing with the Camtasia, though, is um, you can buy it as a one-time purchase. Now, granted, you're, they're going to be versioning and getting more and more versions on top of it, but it's not software as a service where you're paying, you know, $15 a month. Got it. And that, that's where, you know, people look at, oh, well, Adobe Premiere Pro is so much less expensive. Well, if you do it for one year, it's a little less expensive. If you're going to do it for a couple of years, you're going to keep paying that that monthly fee for the software as a service. Got it. So uh, another you question. What's happened? I'm sorry. Did someone have a question out there? Okay. Uh, what happens when your subscription ends? Can you still use the saved materials? Uh, it depends on how you save the materials. You can no longer edit them in Camtasia because you don't have the software subscription anymore. But again, if you do the buy the standalone version of Camtasia, you can use it until you want to upgrade. If you save your material as 
MP4 files or I post a lot of my lessons up into YouTube and caption them up there for ADA compliance, you've got those forever. Got it. Okay. And maybe we'll take one or two more questions and I'm, I'm taking these questions directly from chat. Sure. Um, so I, I wanted to know the green um, background that you have currently, is it a physical something that you attach to your chair or is, where can I purchase that particular green? <laughs> well, what I'm, <laughs> what I'm sitting in front of right now is a thing that attaches to the back of my chair. So it's a big I, thing. So if I'm on a video call, I can, I can actually put up an image behind me. And a lot of the uh, um, meeting software will do that without a, a physical green screen, but it tends to work a little bit better that way. So what do I search if I want to purchase one, something like that attaches um, to my chair? I think you like pop up chair green screen. Because this thing is actually, you can twist it and it goes down to be about yay so big. But it, it's a fairly big piece, so be aware of that. You've got to have some room for this thing to swing around. And, and Rima, I'll offer that. I believe Joseph has placed the uh, link to the green screen that Tom is using. Yeah, I chat. just saw that. Yeah, thank you. Well, cool. this is the one I have on the back of my chair. I've got one point the right that way uh, that is actually against a wall. And the thing is, you don't actually have to have a green screen to record well. You just have a ha need a consistent color on the wall that is a significant contrast from your skin tone. And that's why it's a green screen or sometimes you see a blue screen because it's so different from skin tone so that the computer software can remove it easily. Got it. Okay. Um... I guess what we'll do at this point is we'll start to train. So again, Tom, thank you so very much for putting the time and effort into preparing this video um, and getting it to uh, a length that is very, very um, uh, demonstrative of, of the capabilities associated with, with Camtasia for our faculty. So thank you very much. And there's been a lot of requests for access to this video and we're gonna post it to the dli.northcarolina.edu website by early next week or sooner. So thank you again. And at this time, we're going to transition over to Pear and the McGraw-Hill team. And they're gonna talk about leveraging McGraw-Hill Connect products. And Pear, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much and thank you for giving me and us the opportunity to present this morning. Uh, I will show uh, everyone on this call how I've been using Connect here in just a few minutes, but before then I will turn it over to Aaron who will talk just about Connect a little bit in general first. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, we're excited to be here. So yes, with Connect, we've had that um, learning platform for over a decade now. And over the time, we have changed drastically from just some basic multiple choice questions to more of adaptive. So with our adaptive, we have um, adaptive and assignable reading with our smart book. We also have adaptive prep assignments. Some of those could vary between the disciplines. We could have some math prep or some basic prep for some of the science classes. We have a variety of videos and multimedia. So some courses could have a full media bank. Some may have videos that basically cover a quick overview of the chapter. Some may have some assignable videos that break down learning objectives for students. And then most recently, we've added the last two bullets, one being a writing tool we have added it so we have some manual grading to give students some writing assistance along with customized rubrics that you can use, whether it's from McGraw-Hill or from one of your own. We also have a few auto-graded assignable activities as well, but that's just with a few titles. Um, and then exam proctoring. Um, McGraw-Hill has partnered with Proctorio and we have embedded some in proctoring tools and settings within our assignments. So you can have some lockdown browser features, some video monitoring, some screen share, and that comes with them some different varieties on that. And then as you can see below, with all these activities, we do cover these within the disciplines that are mentioned below, along with some other things. And I do think I missed one point. I did miss the activity-based assignments. Those are probably one of my new favorites. Um, the activity-based assignments can range from anywhere from a mini simulation 
to a role play or even a choose your own destination kind of situation for the students. Many of those are topic based and these activities have been al allowing us to make some adjustments in there. So if like things with like the pandemic, here's going to show you one that was added to the econ list where we are keeping up with current events. So Pear, I'm going to pass it over to you so you can go into your course. Thank you. So when I first started teaching large section courses of economics, I was a little overwhelmed by the prospect of how do I get my students to do economics? I knew that I could tell them about economics and the textbook, they could read about economics, but pretty much like anything else, if you want to get really good at it, you have to do it as well. And so I started looking at a lot of these different online platforms that existed. And the key thing that I was looking for was something that would adopt to my teaching approach. In other words, I wanted to make sure that the platform adopted to how I wanted my class to be rather than me having to adopt to a software uh, just to, to make it work. And that has been, to me, the, the key strength in Connect that it really adopts to different instructors how they want to use this platform as well as adopting to the students in that class. Kind of similar to that is a key feature of flexibility. Uh, over the last couple of months, we have seen a lot of unplanned changes. And in some of my classes, I really had to scramble to meet these new challenges. However, in the classes where I was already using Connect, it really wasn't that much work to go from what I was already doing to a fully online environment. So that flexibility was really helpful in the spring and in this fall as we're still seeing a lot of changes coming our way. I also wanna mention before I get into my courses how much Connect has been evolving. So I'm one of those instructors that started using Connect when it was brand new. I've, I've been using this platform for over 12 years and I have seen it evolve as new tools become available, but also as instructors like myself have feedback. So I have requested certain things to happen and Connect has uh, adopted those suggestions, which has been very satisfying. And then lastly, I wanna mention uh, something else that has been very helpful in my large sections, and that is all the reports that I have access to. That could be reports on a specific student's performance. So if a student comes to talk to me and during office hours, I have access to everything that that student has done when they started an assignment, what time they started, how many minutes they spent. And so a lot of times we can have a very focused conversation where I bring to the attention of the student that if you start 15 minutes before the due date, it's not going to work. And so we can kind of go beyond, I'm not, sure what is happening here and, and really drilled in, in on, on what changes need to happen. It also allows me to pull reports on what concepts the whole class is struggling with. So it's not a student doing something, it's everyone struggling with it. And that allows for a much more focused uh, classroom time where I can bring those questions into class, we can talk about those and really use our time in the best possible way. But rather than just talking about these tools, let's take a look here. So I'm going to uh, go into a demo uh, course here that I set up. And right here, we're looking at the main page of a Connect course. So for me, that is microeconomics for the fall, but it could of course be any of the disciplines that you show, we showed you on that previous slide. Much of my work is gonna be done here on the left-hand side. This is where I create and organize my assignments. Uh, but there's also some useful things here on the right hand side, uh, including ebooks and performance once uh, students start doing work in here so I can see how things are going. And then towards the end on the right hand side, I'll get to this towards the very end of my presentation, how I can record lectures right here in Connect that's easy for students to access. Now, anytime I want to create an assignment, I go through the same process of adding an assignment. Once they have been added, I can organize them by a, a chapter like I've done here for supply and demand. So within this module, I have several different type of assignments depending on the purpose of the assignment. Or I can organize it by what's graded and what's just for practice. 
by weeks or anything else that works well for your course. Now I mentioned that there are different type of assignments for different purposes. Essentially, if we look at this from a Bloom's taxonomy standpoint, this first one is an adoptive introduction assignment that essentially takes the place of just reading a textbook from page one to the last page. This is a much smarter way of reading. And so I'm gonna go in here and show you what this looks like from a student perspective. This is a supply and demand chapter and there is kind of a AI component here that is telling me that I haven't been reading for a while and so maybe it's time to do so. And I can definitely do this, read this as if it was an online textbook, but it does give some extra help to a student who may not know uh, how to best read things by highlighting certain components and saying this is really important for you to focus on. So if some of your students do the traditional way of, of learning, reading, they can do so, or they can focus on this blue box down here that was blinking. Uh, this is where we are learning by essentially answering questions. And a student can blindly start answering questions here and say, I have no idea what's going on. And they can do so for quite a while, whether it's typing in answers, whether it is, you know, pick an alternative, fill in the blank, etc. And the student can do this. The problem is that if we look down here, we're not getting anywhere. We have 62 more items to learn. And as long as we're not getting anything right, we're not getting any closer to that. In fact, what will happen is we get this person show up and tell us that maybe reading is the approach to go with. And the student can therefore use this little tool here and get help. This is what we're talking about. This is the key aspects for this learning objective. And then once we have read up on that, we are much better at knowing what the answers are. So this is a great way to introduce a new concept. This is the first time that my students interact with this material and they won't learn everything and they won't be, you know, experts in terms of analyzing and applying the material, but they do come to class knowing almost all the key terms. And so we can have a much more productive classroom setting when I don't have to give them definitions. They already know that by the time class starts and they'll keep going on here until they have fulfilled the 62 required correct answers. And by then they have gotten a wide variety of questions on this topic. And the nice thing here is that the learning adopts to the students. So if a student keeps getting a certain concept right, the program will learn pretty quickly. Okay, they know what supply is all about. Whereas if I keep getting questions in a certain area wrong, they'll keep throwing more of those questions in to make sure that I'm truly learning. So the path won't be the same for all students. It will be just as individualized as the students are. So Learn Smart or Smart Book is a great way to introduce students to the concepts that we are gonna talk about in class. And therefore, that's always my first assignment. So this adopted to the student, but not so much to me, the instructor. I just set this up and let students uh, work with it. So the next assignment that I'm gonna go into is a much more traditional homework type of assignment. And I'm gonna go into the editing view so that you can see what instructors do. So here I have all the, I make all the rules in terms of what my students will see. It adopts to me. So you can see that there's a lot of different type of questions. There's graphing, there is multiple choice, there is usually numerical answers. There's also a lot of these questions that has this A symbol. That's an algorithmic type of problem, meaning that all students will get the same question statements, but not the same answer. Or if the same student takes this assignment more than once, the answers are not the same every time. So this graph will remain the same, but there are about eight different versions where the student need to fill in different information in here. And there's a lot of these algorithmic type of questions for students to work through. Now, 
even if the questions aren't set up as algorithmic, you can essentially do the same by creating pools, which is what you see up here, where I have picked four or three questions that are very similar. And then I'm telling Connect that each student should get two or one out of that pool. So again, two students working together won't get the same question or a student taking more than one attempt will get something new every time. I should mention that for those instructors like myself who truly wants to uh, have this adopt to you, there is this little feature right up here that looks like a toolbox where I can go in and I can edit the question. That means taking out words that I don't agree with, adding explanations when I think they need to, or maybe there's an A part, but I like there to be a B and a C and a D part. All of those things can be done. So connect truly adopts to you, again, rather than you having to adopt to connect. So you can use this kind of out of the box or you can individualize every single question on every single assignment. I also mentioned that you have a lot of control in terms of policy. So I wanna show you that page as well. And the policy side, we have four type of assignments. So this could be a homework, practice, quiz, and exam. And Connect will remember what the rules are for each one of these. And then if we expand here the settings, you can see I can control anything from the number of attempts to the type of resources they have to when they get feedback, how they get feedback, do they get feedback differently after the first, second, third attempt, etc. So all of that is up to me and I can you know, make it a certain way for homework, a different way for practice, a third way for quiz, et cetera. So that would be your traditional type of homework assignment, just with a lot of individual control. Looking at my module here for supply and demand, we have talked about the first two. There are then interactive graph assignments that is really helpful in uh, economics, for example. I'm just gonna show you this uh, from a student perspective. So here is questions that deal with supply and demand and taxes. And this really lets the student go in here and manipulate things, work with things so that it's not just standard, but uh, something that they can control and see what happens when these lines become steeper, flatter, more or less elastic. What happens if there is a tax put into this market, who is going to be paying that tax, etc. All of that information becomes available to the student and they can play around with this in a way that you just cannot do on a piece of paper. So this truly gets us beyond stationary learning. And those are the interactive graphs where the students are interacting with the material and then having to answer set questions. Aaron mentioned that we also have in here assignments that are uh, getting at some kind of application. So this one is about the current pandemic. So it's really up to date, but there are lots of these to choose from that uh, student gets to, to really apply the information we have been talking about. And in this case, it's using these kind of little avatars here that are having a conversation about, uh, in this case, N95 masks and how, uh, you know, there's not as many of these around as we would like to see. And we can listen into the conversation, but before not too long, we are going to have to make answers. And if we get them right, we are told that that's the case. And if we get these answers wrong, there's an economics mentor here that comes in and tells us how we should have answered it. So this really takes the information from, again, just reading or answering multiple choice questions to realizing how this actually is used in a day-to-day -day situation. And there are these kind of application assignments for pretty much any topic in economics. So that has been extremely helpful for me and my students. And so I'm going to return here one more time to our main page. And then I have also provided my students with a practice version of the homework. 
And this is again, one of these easy things that we can do with a good online platform. I essentially copy my homework. I change the policy settings, click submit or, or post. And all of a sudden, all the work that I put into my homework now gets a little bit more mileage because the students have a practice version where they can work in that up until the date of the exam. So again, a way for me to use Connect uh, to, to kind of do what I need Connect to do. And I'm even giving my students exams on the Connect platform. And of course, when I do so, I'm using a lot of these uh, pools and algorithmic questions. So even if the students are very close to each other, you can see that they're not going to get the same questions. So I feel confident using Connect, even for my high stake assignments. The last thing I want to mention here before I give you a chance to ask me questions is the feature I mentioned that I can record my lectures within the platform so that students don't have to go look for those elsewhere. Now, I've already opened this up in a different window. So this is a listing of recordings that I have made within Connect on the different topics that relate to supply and demand. And you can see that the first view here is kind of a breakdown in terms of what the background was as I was doing this lecture. And the student can either start from the very beginning or they can jump in a little bit later into the video and do so. But if we start from the beginning, it's going to uh, pull up here. Most people hear the, the me talking, and I'm not sure if you could hear that audio or not, but that would be me talking to uh, the lecture slides that I use uh, during my class. And so the students essentially get all the same things here as if they were in a class with me, rather they're just online and they are in the same uh, program as where all their work takes place. So a very kind of all around system here for the students learning. I also want to mention here since I, uh, or show you since I mentioned the vast amount of reports that are in here anything from traditional assignment results to specific uh, students, their performance, assignment statistics, and this item analysis that again, makes me aware of what learning objectives are really hard for the class as a whole, so that I can bring back those questions in class and talk about them. I can even get a report at at-risk students to make sure that I reach out to those students that struggle early on so they don't get left behind. That's kind of a, a short version of all the many tools that I use in my Connect sections, all the many tools that makes me a more efficient instructor and also I think provides a much better learning environment for my students. So John, there are questions. I'm happy to address those at this point. Yeah, certainly. And, and first, uh, Pear and, and the McGraw-Hill team, what a fantastic product and tool. And I think, Pear, to your point, to the extent that we can make instruct in, instruction more effective and efficient, as well as learning more effective and efficient, I think those are tools that uh, we as educators really want to look at. So, so thank you for bringing this to the attention of the digital learning community. There are questions in the chat room. But I'm going to ask if there are folks in the audience who would like to pose a live question to Pear, please unmute and pose your question. If not, I'll work on the, uh, the chat questions. Okay. Um, so I think one of the quick questions is how does the, the connect learning environment present itself to the student. And what I mean by that is, can it be integrated into the learning management system through some level of LTI integration so that, look, so that it looks native to the learning management system, whether it's Canvas or any other? And obviously, the, 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 the root of that question is around ensuring a streamlined learning environment for the student. Absolutely. You can pair a connect with most of all, all the major uh, learning platforms. So I have personally used Blackboard, Canvas, and Moodle, and all of them have had complete integration with Connect, meaning that 
the students could either go to the Connect site or to their LMS and click on assignments within either one of those platforms. All grades are then housed in both platforms. So my students now, I don't really ever give them the Connect website, even though many of them can find that if they want. They just go to Canvas that we use on our campus or Moodle before then and click the assignments there. So for, for them, it's really just a, a simple click within the, the environment that they're already familiar with. Fantastic. Um, the, the next uh, question is around cost. And from your experience, Pear, uh, what is the average cost to the student or, or what is the model that's been implemented at your institution? And in fact, if the McGraw-Hill team wants to weigh in on that one as well, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm going to take this one. So in a lot of cases, there have been um, like, well, so even at Pears Institution at UNC Charlotte, um, we have partnered with Barnes and Noble and or Follett and or the independent store through their inclusive access programs. So many of the four year schools have started this where they have begun to implement this um, inclusive access where the students will be actually paying for course materials within their tuition. And in so the students have received a greatly reduced price in Connect. It's actually cheaper than what they can find on Amazon. It is um, direct on the first day. So students do not have to worry about an access code. They do not have to worry about courtesy access. They can use financial aid and it's it's even it's even for the students because you know institution schools in the in the company bookstores do have a markup on items so therefore if students are using financial aid they're going through the bookstore and they have to use that with the markup on there where students can other students may be able to buy direct from a publisher whether it's us or another one and they may actually be spending um, a little less so the inclusive access program keeps it even for all students. So that way they're paying the price. And with this agreement too, we've been able to have an optional loose leaf for the students all full color um, that they can have at a reduced price. So I think for many of the courses, it's around $25. For some of the two semester courses, it's around $35, even with the bookstore markup on that part. So with this partnership, we've been able to keep the margins down. Students are are happy because they have everything on the first day. Startup part of it with uh, courtesy access or waiting for financial aid or wondering if their code was entered correctly. All of that gets taken out of the equation, which is usually what happens in these first couple weeks because they paid for it, right? So they want to make sure they enter it right. They want to make sure they use it right. And we completely understand that. So with that said, there are a couple of different pricing levels within some of the disciplines as well. So it's, it's we don't have one straight price. There's a couple of different pricing things, but I would encourage you if you want to reach out to me or anybody else or me or Jay on the screen. And if you want to learn more about what we have going on with your particular institution, that would be the best way to go with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And I'll just mention, I think, uh, speaking generally here, my, my experience have been that if students feel that they're actually getting a value for what they pay, in other words, and that this is not an extra thing, they are much less likely to object to the cost. And so because my mm -hmm. students do so much work in Connect, I think they pretty much realize that this is the book, this is the possibly lecture, this is the assignments, this is everything they do baked into one. Whereas I've had other classes where I might be asked them to purchase something with a much lower cost, but is in addition to, and that seemed to cause much more anxiety among students. So since this is kind of the bulk of what they do, I think that they, they appreciate what they're getting for that value. Yeah. Well, thank you for that pair. And, and I would like to, uh, make all of our participants aware that Aaron Patrick has posted a statement about McGraw-Hill's commitment to complying to regulations such as uh, FERPA in the, the chat room. So if you're interested in that and how data is handled and maintained, feel free to read through that. But also I think, Perry, you, you mentioned that grading uh, as handled through the LTI connection enables 
uh, grading to be shared with the learning management system, which would be held or retained in support of FERPRA and other student data retention policies. Are there other questions that anyone would like to pose? If, if not, a, I've got one that just a point that I'd like to make. No? Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to say, Pear, uh, I, I really appreciated you pointing out from a Bloom's taxonomy perspective, the level of learning that can be attained through this type of system, but also the type of instructional strategies and pedagogies that can be supported with this tool, meaning, you know, flipping the classroom, such as what Tom discussed earlier. Students are, are learning uh, before they come to class at a conceptual level gaining that conceptual understanding. And then when they show up to class, they're ready to do more active learning, perhaps project level learning and, and things of that nature. And so with these systems, it'd be interesting to understand your perspective of to what level of Bloom's taxonomy do you think the, the, the tool can take learning? I think I heard you say up to a conceptual level, but the application and integration is something that has to happen outside. So I, I just thought it was a really important point. And that has been one of the great things, you know, in, in recent years, how this has developed from, you know, at, at first it was really just application and a little bit of understanding. And now, uh, you know, from that, that adoptive learning that really just gets at remembering and understanding to the, the exercise I showed you with, COVID-19, which is much more of a kind of analyzing what these people are talking about, because it's not always straightforward questions, you know, where right. the student just has to take increase, decrease. They have to kind of understand what these, these avatars are talking about and apply it. So yeah. uh, I feel like it's, it's really getting to where we want the students to be, because I think when I first started using a platform like this, the problem was that I wanted them so high in that taxonomy uh, charge and mm -hmm. they complained that there just wasn't enough before the exam that, that really got them there. And, and I feel like today I can truly walk them up the, 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 the pyramid and then my exam really is where I needed to be. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, and, and thank you to the McGraw-Hill team for uh, supporting this presentation as well. We are about four minutes uh, of 12 o'clock. And as I mentioned earlier, and as Jim always drives us to, that is respecting the time of our presenters, respecting the time of our participants. So if there aren't any additional uh, questions, I'd like to just drop back into the original presentation that I was, uh, had opened before and just make some final comments and we will move on with our weekends. How does that sound? So the first thing, if you all can see my screen, I'm sure you can, is that our next DLI webinar is scheduled for September 25th. During this webinar, we will have Charles Weinberg with UNC Asheville and he's the Associate Director of Music Technology and he's gonna be talking to us about the application of OBS Studio for live streaming of musical performances, uh, as well as Rachel Gold, Associate Professor of English at the North Carolina Central University. And Rachel's gonna bring to us a lot of energy in the area of, of kinetic instruction for online learning, a really interesting pedagogical approach uh, and associated instructional strategy. So you're gonna wanna tune in for that. And as always, if you have some comments or suggestions for future webinars, please contact Jim or myself. You can see our contact information there. And please remember to check out the Digital Learning Initiative blog, dli.northcarolina.edu. And on the bottom here, you can see the different types uh, or areas of information that are provided uh, within this website. You can get to previous webinar series, our upcoming DLI symposium, COVID-19 resources, our blog, and perhaps learn a little bit more about our DLI team. So with that, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters, and we hope to see you again next month for the next DLI webinar. Same time, same, same URL. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, John. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.